Hi, everybody. Welcome to the One World Minds talk of Philipp Peterson. So Philipp did his PhD in Berlin, and then he went to do a postdoc in Oxford. And since 2019, he's assistant professor at the University of Vienna. And we are very happy that he will tell us something about um, optical, optimal learning of classifier functions. Philip, thank right. you. <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to all the organizers. Um, I'm very happy to speak here. <clears throat> I will talk about uh, learning and especially about classification. So this is joint work with Felix Vogtländer. Um, the paper that I'm going to talk about was supposed to be ready two months ago. Then we decided maybe it should be ready today, ready for the talk. It looks like it's going to be tomorrow. <laughs> Could also be Sunday, but probably tomorrow. Um, at the very least, next week, you can <clears throat> look at it. So um, I want to talk about classification and in the simplest scenario, it's like this is this is the scenario. Someone gives you, <clears throat> at least in this binary classification problem, that will um, be the most interesting for us to have the talk. In the binary classification problem, uh, some person gives you um, data. <clears throat> Might have two classes. One are blue circles. The other one may be red crosses. Could also be zeros and ones. And then there is one more point which you just don't know the class, you don't know if it's a circle or a cross, um, and you're supposed to come up with a prediction for that. In this case, this is here, this question. And if I look at this, and I'm not sure if you're the same, <clears throat> I mean, I immediately try and uh, separate the whole um, plane, so to speak, in regions, in regions that I would color red, in regions that I would color blue, and then if in my mind this question mark falls into the red region, I would classify it as red. Otherwise, I would classify it as blue. So we think that there's going to be some kind of spatial relationship between the two. But most importantly, we think of regions. So I would probably draw some kind of um, line between the red and the blue circles, uh, red crosses and blue circles, and then see that for me, the question mark falls into the red region and then I would classify it as red. So a bit more um, mathematically, our setup is as follows. So we have observations. I would always call them xi and yi. So these are random variables. And they, are, they have a joint distribution, uh, which I call p, x, and y. So it's joint with x and y. <coughs> we have n of them, small n of them. These are our observations. So the xi's, these are the positions, basically, of the points and the crosses and the circles. And the y's, those are the labels. So they explain to us what, what class it is. I will usually have yi to be just 0 or 1. That's a classical binary classification problem. But sometimes, just because the literature sometimes isn't the same, uh, doesn't use it in the same way everywhere, uh, y will also be minus 1 or 1. So be prepared that uh, it might change. But I will, I will mention when it changes. So what I then want is I want some kind of prediction rule. So I want to have some y hat. It's again a random variable. And y hat should classify as good as I can. So basically, I want this, one would maybe call this the 0, 1 loss of my prediction rule to be as small as possible. So what does it mean? So I look at the random variable y hat, and I want this to be equal to y, where y has the same distribution as all the y i's. I also sometimes call this uh, the risk. So, and just, you know, but this E here, so the risk of this prediction rule should be very small. That's what I want. Yeah, so most of the times uh, it classifies correctly. And now there's an interesting fact, which is that there is an optimal prediction rule. And this optimal prediction rule looks as follows. Uh, it's the characteristic function of a set G star. Um, so this is down here. I hat is the characteristic function of a set G star. So here, characteristic function, I use this is one. Um, and G star, these are all the X <coughs> such that this condition of probability here is larger or equal than one half. So that's the probability that I see one as a label given X. Now this is the optimal classification. 
Um, obviously, I cannot use that because I don't know this probability distribution. I didn't say that at the beginning, but this one is not known to us. Yeah, but the optimal way to classify, at least if you want to minimize this one, is to find two regions like here on the right, um, and then classify everything as one that is in one region and everything as zero that's in the other region. Okay. Now, what makes this a hard or a simple problem? Well, there are a couple of, um, let's say, characteristics that a classification problem may have. One of them is uh, the complexity of this G star. Yeah. So the, the set that separates the two regions that may have a complexity. And so you see here, I have three very simple classical classification problems, two where I'm trying to classify um, flowers, and one where I'm trying to classify digits. Uh, and in the one in the middle, you see that maybe this G star, I mean, this is obviously not the true G star, it's just my approximation to the true G star. It looks quite complicated. It's a, it's a rough shape. Whereas in the other two images, it's less rough. And so I would probably say those have simpler decision regions than the one in the center. Another thing that makes a problem hard or not so hard is if there's noise. Yeah, it could be that some of the labels are just not correct. Um, and that makes things harder. So in the one in the center, again, you could, you could say that maybe this one here is, um, is noisy. Um, so the truth is it isn't, but we could assume that, that this is just noise and it is an outlier. And if you have many of those, then it makes the problem hard. And the final pro property of a classification problem that I would say makes it hard or not so hard is a margin. Uh, if you look at a very simple classification problem like this MNIST, uh, we just want to differentiate between zeros and ones. <clears throat> then here I have the classification boundary and you see that it has a pretty large margin between uh, well, the curve and both of the classes. And that's also something where we would say this probably makes things much easier. So there is a kind of formalization of this, which is already quite old, by like Tsibakov, uh, which um, I found in this paper, Smooth Discrimination Analysis, um, where two of those properties are analyzed. And then it's understood how this affects the compl complexity of the learning, the classification problem. So the first one is this so-called noise condition. Um, <clears throat> what is asked for here? So we have this eta, which is the conditional probability that we've already seen before in the definition of the optimal uh, regions. So this is the probability that we see as a label one given x. And what I want now in this condition is I want to know how much mass is very close to the decision boundary in a sense. Yeah. Um, but, but this is still, still a bit different. So if eta, yeah, this conditional probability is exactly equal to one half, then the probability that at this point I see a label one or a label zero, that's the same. So it's very hard to use this point for any kind of classification uh, to predict anything. Um, so I basically want very few of those points. Yeah. So um, all the acts such that this is pretty small so that I'm close to this decision region, which is exactly at one half, um, those should be few. Yeah? So if I take T going to zero, then if Q is quite large, which I hope, then this decays very quickly. Um, that's the first condition. Um, so here, this maybe isn't so satisfied because we have this, let's call it outlier. Um, Oh, but maybe it is, yeah, I mean, we, we cannot see really the probability distribution, but this is the noise condition. Um, and the second one is the complexity condition. So now I'm saying I'm not looking for all sets that could be decision regions, but I have a certain reservoir of possible sets. I might call them G. And if this has a certain property, namely that it has low complexity, then that's good. So this complexity is here measured in terms of entropy. And in fact, this is bracketing entropy, which I will explain after I've finished this sentence or the next sentence. 
Um, so if this complexity is small, so I want to have like a small R here, so it doesn't grow that quickly with delta going to zero, then that's also a good thing. So what is a bracketing entropy? Um, you know that you compute the regular entropy by just finding um, epsilon nets of your set, and then looking at the size of the, uh, the number of elements in an epsilon net. Well, for bracketing entropy, you're not looking at just epsilon nets, but you look at pairs of uh, a series of pairs of sets or functions or elements, um, and you want all um, all points in your like G to be kind of wedged between two of them, and then if the size of those determines this entropy. It's not really important what it is exactly. It's just it's a measure of complexity of this G, and one also needs to control this. Okay, so if you have these two properties these two conditions, then there is a way to learn the optimal classifier. And this is also the optimal way of learning it. So what is shown there is <clears throat> if you have now an epsilon net, and this is exactly one of that has this bracketing property. And this comes from this bracketing property. If you have an epsilon net, let's call it n, you're looking at the best classifier in this epsilon net. And so this one here is the zero one loss. So I'm looking at all my data points and I look um, where, where do I make a mistake? And I want to make as few mistakes as possible. And I take the best G in this, in this epsilon net. Well, this one is going to achieve the following learning bound. <clears throat> so I'm looking here at the worst possible uh, probability distribution of my data. And then I look on average, so this is the expected value over the samples. Um, and then this is the loss, the risk from the first slide of the minimizer that I found here. And I subtract the best possible loss that I could make, best possible risk that I could make, which is just G star, which is the solution that we want in the end. Yeah? And so this thing, this will decay of a certain rate. This rate is uh, too complex, too complicated to go through now, but it depends on this Q, the, um, the number from the noise condition, and it depends on the R, the number from the complexity. And if R is very small, then this can be somewhat larger. And if Q is very large, then this is also getting closer and closer to hopefully one. Yeah, so the best. Um, rate that is achievable with this method is n to the minus one. That's what Tsibakov calls a fast approach, a fast rate. Now, this is all nice, and this is kind of the best way to, to classify it, but it has a, certain, a couple of issues. Um, so the first thing is I need to find some kind of epsilon net offsets, and then I need to optimize over this, which seems complicated. Um, also, this loss is a zero one loss. So, um, for people who are familiar with like deep learning, which I will talk about next, we want to have maybe some loss that is differentiable that we can then minimize using some gradient method. Uh, this is not possible here. And also, obviously, I mean, yeah, the, the worst thing is finding these epsilon nets. Um, so, obviously, we want to do something different. We want to do we want to get the optimal classifier, but we want to do it using deep neural networks. So for this, I very briefly have to uh, talk about deep neural networks. Basically, I think that most people here know exactly what I'm talking about, but I want to fix the notation and maybe everyone has a different kind of definition. <clears throat> so deep learning is when we're doing, when we are doing empirical risk minimization. So what I've done before, I minimize some kind of loss, um, but the set that I'm minimizing over is now a set of neural networks. Usually, I fix some kind of architecture. And what is a neural network? A neural network is a map, and it maps from Rd. So D is then my input dimension to Rnl, and L would be the output dimension. Why the L? Well, this L stands for the number of layers that this network has. Um, I typically also have something that we call an activation function, rho. In my talk, and in most talks, rho is the ReLU. So ReLU of x is just the max between x and 0. And then um, 
there are certain numbers of neurons, which are denoted by N1 to NL. So this NL is also the output one here. Um, these are the numbers of neurons in each of the layers. I need a fine linear maps, uh, L of them, large L of them. And so they map from RNL minus one to RNL. Um, and then my network, a network is a function of this form. I want to first apply the first fine linear transform then coordinate wise the activation function and so on and so forth until the very end where I apply this T large L. So in this figure here, you can also see it. D is the input dimension. Then I apply the, so the figure on the top right, I don't know if you can see my cursor. So you apply this D, uh, you apply to the input dimension D, you apply T1, then you have a new vector of length N1 and so on and so forth. One thing that you might find not so good is that I don't apply the row or anything in the last layer, even though I have a classification problem where you might say, well, you usually have just values between zero and one. So why don't you apply something that is, I don't know, a heavy side function or something um, to just set the values. I could do that. It wouldn't actually change any of the results that come later. Okay. Um, now, Let's, let's revisit this kind of complexity condition that we saw already in the results from Tsibakov. I want to have, I want to restrict sort of the sets that I, that I can use for classification. And I want to do it using a sort of smoothness assumption. So this part is a slight bit more general than classification because I'm now looking at approximation of piecewise smooth functions. They could be piecewise, con piecewise constant as in a classification problem. Um, so I'm looking at functions where f is described or is given as a function f1 plus and then this characteristic function of a set b times f2. Yeah. For simplicity, you can always think of as f1 as 0 and f2 as 1, and uh, you would be in the setup of this talk. Um, but this is slightly more general. And then the characteristic function of b, well, you see now I use this chi instead of the one. Um, I'm not always very consistent here. Um, it is special in the sense that the boundary of B has a specific regularity. Yeah, I prescribe that. And that's how I want to now look at all my classification problems. These are functions um, and the boundary curve of those has a certain prescribed regularity. So a kind of old theorem is, uh, I mean, it's from 2017, is if the boundary is k times continuously differentiable, uh, I have a set B, it's in zero, one to the power D. It's of the form that we just talked about. The Fi's have to be CK and the boundary is also CK. So K times continuously differentiable. Then <clears throat> we find a neural network Phi and has M weights. I didn't specify what weights are. Weights are the non-zero entries of these matrices and shifts that are in, in a fine linear transform. So the active parameters. And I have a, a number L, which is then again the, number, the layer of this, the number of layers of this phi. And they have the following, well, they satisfy the following conditions. The approximation by phi decays as number of weights to the minus k divided by two, and then d minus one. And the number of layers is bounded by k divided by d. So this, um, this is the optimal approximation rate for some, some for any kind of scheme with these number of parameters. So this m to the minus k divided by d uh, to d minus one. And what I find interesting is that the number of layers here is bounded, uniformly bounded. Uh, so it doesn't depend on, on anything except k and d. <laughs> um, uh, because usually if you know like approximation results with um, ReLU, uh, then you will see that usually you want the layers to grow for epsilon going to zero for the approximation if it's just over zero, they, they should grow to infinity. Whereas here we can could get away with boundedness, with bounded uh, layers. And another thing that might be quite interesting for this community here is that this rate kind of kind of finishes the story that at least I and many others were looking at a couple of years ago, um, 
um, where uh, people were studying wavelets and then found out that they can't approximate uh, functions that have distributed singularities that well. And then people came up with curvelets and shearlets and all other kind of lets to approximate functions that have jumps along curves. And they could do it in the optimal way if k is two. Now this kind of finishes the picture for arbitrary k, because here we have an optimal approximation scheme kind of not adapted, um, and it achieves the optimal approximation rate, and it's neural networks. OK, so I want to very briefly talk about the proof of this, um, but only like sketch. So you have a, have a picture, and then we talk more about estimation. So what we do in the first step is we're trying to, I mean, first localize, because okay, we're, we're trying to approximate a function that is piecewise constant. Um, and now I want to just look at it locally. Um, so I cut out a little piece, and I tell you later how that is done. And then it looks like a horizon function, a function that is um, given as a characteristic function, and then the first coordinate could also be any other co coordinate is bounded by a smooth function of all the other coordinates. Yeah, so that that means its boundary is since its boundary is ck, you can always do that. And then this gamma is a ck function. Now a different way of writing this is by just using a horizon function of gamma of then what well, the coordinates minus x1, a horizon function, sorry, a heavy side function. So using the heavy side function of this. Yeah. And that's nice to look at it this way because the heavy side function is very easy to rebuild with neural nets, um, basically like here. So you first have a redo that starts at some point, and then you have a second redo that stops it. So it's kind of like a ramp um, that stops. And then if you rescale this, you can get as close as you want in LP, not in L infinity, to the heavy side function. And so this gamma is a smooth function. We can approximate this by networks with, let's say, classical theory, which isn't exactly true because we have to do everything again because we wanted these bounded number of layers. But still, um, you can approximate this by nets, uh, sums and, and the likes you can approximate by nets as well. You can actually implement by nets and then the heavy side I told you. So that's it, pretty much how one does this proof. Now let's talk about learning. Um, <clears throat> How to learn these classifier functions now um, with neural networks? Well, this is not a result by us. Yeah? We will have later a learning bound test that comes from us. But this one is actually, uh, we found in the literature, and it's a very nice result. So um, you can basically minimize the so-called hinge loss um, and find by this empirical risk minimization, you can find a neural net that achieves almost the optimal estimation bounds for this class. So how is it done? Well, first of all, the hinge loss, this is this small phi here. It's basically applying this function. Yeah, so it's two if um, the input is minus one, it's one if the input is zero, it's, uh, it's zero. No, it's one if the input is zero, it's zero if the input is one. And I input here, well, f, that's the function that, I'm, uh, that, I, that I have. But I put this tilde. Yeah? So what, what do I mean by this tilde? I said at the beginning, sometimes people do zero and one as the labels. Sometimes it's minus one and one. The hinge loss works, works better with minus one and one. So if I'm putting the tilde, it means that I basically shift the output from zero, one to minus one, one. Yeah? So now the classes are minus one and one. And the same with the yi. So basically, I'd multiply here um, the true label with my predicted label. And if they both have the same sign, they're both one, for example, then the output is one and the hinge loss of it is zero. If they have different labels, then this is minus one, hinge of it of it, of it will be minus, there will be two. Yeah, so it just basically wants them to have the same labels. Um, and the minimizer of this thing over all the observations n, if my f star, this is the one that I want to learn, has a CK regular learning error. Uh, a class boundary, that one decays of a certain rate. Here again, this Q appears, this is from the noise condition, and the K is, uh, is the smoothness here, and then there's D because we're doing this in D-dimensional space. Um, there are also some log factors here. And it's not important to look exactly at this rate, 
uh, this is almost optimal. Now, and I will talk about how almost optimal this is later. So this learning procedure gets us the almost optimal rate. Okay, very nice. So now let's find out how optimal this actually is. Okay, and also why are we doing this with CK all the time? We can go much more general. Um, so first of all, this notion of a horizon function that I've talked about, it doesn't have anything to do with CK, it's just functions. So I can define um, a set of horizon functions, which I now call HC for an arbitrary, let's say continuous class of functions um, by just looking at all the horizon functions that are built like this. Yeah, So I have this B, which is this arbitrary function of all the, well, it should actually be D minus one here, I'm sorry. So B maps from zero one to the D minus one to zero one, and then all the horizon functions are built as characteristic function of this form. So it looks like this, yeah. And I can now define all sorts of functions that have C regular decision boundaries sim simply as, well, I should first define a set omega and omega has this kind of decision boundary. If, well, if I just look at it locally, it is given as one of those horizon functions composed with some rotation maybe because Okay, it doesn't always have to be a horizon function in the last coordinate. And so this could be a definition of any kind of set that has a regular decision boundary, which we then hopefully can also learn. And we now want to find out how does the learnability of this class depend on the C. Okay. One very important concept that I now need to review very quickly in this concept, uh, in this context, is covering and packing entropy. Well, in our case, these are even essentially the same. Uh, <laughs> so only... oh, yes. Sorry, Philip. Uh, quick question: What was the C again that you talked about on the last slide? This C, uh, this Cal C, is yeah. just some subset of um, continuous functions. Ah, so, okay. So, so you want to, to you want to look at complexity in terms of how weird this set is, basically, right? Pretty much. That's okay. exactly what I want to do. Okay, okay, okay. So until Thanks. now, C was always CK. Um, and now it can be pretty much anything. Um, as, okay, so quite important in this context are uh, covering entropies. And um, now another question from the chat. So okay. um, uh, the question is, are class C up to rotations or also translations? Uh, here we only do rotations. Okay. Yeah. Even though translation would probably be smart as well. Um, yeah. I mean, the classes that we look at here, they usually, yeah, it would usually not matter because C is already a translation invariant class in most of the cases, but most of the things that I look at later. But um, yeah, uh, we could probably also do translation here. Yeah. So you might want to discuss that with Christoph Schwab later and then for the next paper. Absolutely. Put this yeah. question. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about discovering entropy very quickly. Um, so we have a metric space um, and we have a set in the metric space that could be K, uh, could be called K. Um, so X is the metric space. Uh, an epsilon net of this K, that's simply a set so that every point in K, every X in K has a point in this epsilon net Let's call it y, and the distance is less than epsilon. Yeah? So basically, I want to well, put lots of balls over my uh, set k, and then the number of these, uh, these well, balls that I need, I take the log two of, and that's the covering entropy. And these balls, they have a size epsilon. That's why this covering entropy depends on epsilon. OK, so this will play, play a huge role. <coughs> Uh, sometimes also packing entropy is uh, is used, which is uh, now how many balls can I actually fit into K that are not overlapping. Um, but since this is a metric space, these notions are more or less equivalent. Okay, so now we can get a general lower bound on the learning uh, on learning of any kind of uh, classification functions with any kind of regularity. Yeah. So assuming you have a class C anything. Um, and I'm looking at just learning horizon functions from that class C. 
AM just denotes all possible learning algorithms, so all maps from well, 0, 1 to the D and the labels, and then M of them, so from M samples. Uh, so any learning algorithm in this form, <clears throat> I can now lower bound and upper bound to the optimal uh, learning rate. Yeah, so I look at the infimum over all possible learning algorithms, look at the worst case, so for all H in this HC, and then I look at the L2 error that I'm making yeah, and the expected value over the samples. Um, mu here is, in fact, the, the, the uniform measure. Um, and so this is upper and lower bounded by M, that's the number of observations, to the for the lower bound minus alpha divided by B plus one and upper bound beta divided by B plus one. And these alphas and betas, they relate to the covering entropy in L1 of this class C, yeah? So if the class C is very, very complex, complex then alpha and beta are very small um, because this thing grows quite quickly. And then this has an effect on how good I can learn. I, can, I cannot learn that well. So this is in soup over all uh, possible learning algorithms. So <clears throat> obviously it also holds for our empirical risk minimization problem. All right, so let's first show how this is proven and then discuss what it means. So the proof is quite funny. So first of all, we can relate this learning problem of horizon functions to um, an estimation problem, a density estimation problem. And that works in the following way. Well, first of all, you can see, um, well, you cannot right now not see because I don't put the definition of, the, of this thing. Um, but you have to trust me. So I can have, I can define probability densities, it's called a PB1, such that the L2 distance between the horizon functions, the squared one, is equal to one half the squared Hellinger distance between those two uh, densities. Yeah. Um, so at this point, it's not important what, what all of these things mean. If you know what it means, that's good. But I can relate this kind of, uh, the, this distance to distance between distributions. Yeah, so these are now probability densities. Um, and another equivalence that we have is that the distance between the L2 distance between two uh, horizon functions squared is exactly the same as the L1 distance between just the functions. Yeah, because if you have two horizon functions, um, the where they do not match. The area between those uh, where, they, where they do not match is exactly the area between the two functions that define those horizon functions. So that's the L1 norm. Um, and so this is equal to the squared L2 norm. So that means instead of studying how to learn these H1s, uh, these H's, we can try to learn or estimate these P's. And we can find out the covering and packing entropies uh, with respect to the Hellinger distance of these probability densities by just looking at the covering and packing entropies in L1 of C. Yeah, so this is the kind of <clears throat> way to go. Why would we want to do that? Well, there's a very nice result by uh, Baron and Young from 1999, I think. I cannot see it right now, but I hope this, it was 1999. <clears throat> and it says, well, if you have a set of probability densities P on a d-dimensional space, yeah, here, this is again with minus one and one. And you know something about the packing entropy of this P, not exactly this kind of behavior, um, which is the same as what we had before, just that now here you want to have the Hellinger distance of these packing and uh, these probability densities. Then I can have an interest group bound on estimation of these densities. Yeah, and okay, all these numbers, <clears throat> they are exactly so that it works out. So that our theorem works out. Now, the, the main takeaway is we can translate it to a probability density problem, and then we can get these lower bounds here. And yeah, why is this all interesting? And why is this also, I mean, what is particularly interesting about this result for us is this is an upper and lower bound of the best learning algorithm 
but there's no noise in the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. So I'm learning from H of X I. So our lower bound takes noiseless samples. So it's, I mean, noiseless samples should be maybe easier than noisy samples. At least we don't know what the role of the noise here is. Um, but our lower bounds actually already works for noiseless. Yeah, you have exact measurements, and this is the lower bound. Um, and in some cases, it could be that just adding a little bit of noise makes the problem much harder. And so our lower bound even holds for noiseless samples. Okay, this was the proof. So now this was the optimal lower bound over all possible learning efforts. Now, can we do it with empirical risk minimization? Well, let's look at the L1 uh, packing entropy first of CK, or something like this, that's one to the minus K over D. And the optimal learning rate that um, we could get for CK decision boundaries would then be this one. Yeah, it's, I'm just plugging into the results that we had earlier, so you don't, you don't have to do the computation yourself. Um, this is just me plugging this into what we had. Um, and the previous bound that we've seen was this one. So it's off by just, I mean, there's a factor of one half here in the damage, but that's it. So this rate is almost optimal, the one that we've seen before. Okay, very good. So basically this kind of, to me, finishes the CK problem. We know we can approximate functions with CK boundary. We can also estimate them almost optimally up to some kind of um, small factor. Um, but I'm not yet convinced because this is a nice estimation problem, but it very obviously seriously suffers from the curse of dimension. So um, this, this was a nice exercise, but it totally doesn't reflect what we see in reality. Yeah? So we see the best way to learn these things depends very, very badly on the dimension D. Yeah? D is very large then this one should not decay quickly, the learning bound, and that's not so good. That's also not what we see in practice. If you do image classification, you do not see that the learning bound decays that slowly when D is something like the number of pixels. That's just not true. Um, so we can do estimation for high dimension classification problems, so there must be something else going on. And that's why I'm thinking CK is maybe not the right function class. So let's look at something else. <clears throat> So what I want to look at now is this Baron class. Okay, so the Baron class is a class of functions that is defined um, in the following way. You take, define it through the Fourier transform. So I'm, I'm looking at all F that I can write in terms of its, so as an inverse Fourier transform basically. And for this F, I define a thing called CF, and that is simply the first free moment. Yeah, I take the Fourier transform, absolute values, and then I look at the moment of this. Um, I say that F is in the Baron class, which I now denote by gamma of C, if CF is less than C. Yeah. And this is a very interesting class because, um, because of the following result that is also due to Baron. Um, we can have that if I look at F minus Fn, and Fn being a very well chosen two layer neural network, then this error decays like two times the CF. Okay, this is the, the, the first Fourier moment divided by square root of n. Now, square, square root of n as an approximation rate might not be that good, it might actually be quite bad. But good thing is there is no dependence on D on the right hand side of this inequality. Philip, sorry, there was a oh, question yeah. for the last side, slide. Oh, um, oh. I, um, why does the noise disappear from the lower bound? Is there an intuitive explanation? And could there be a better bound where noise influences the lower bound? Oh, um, or maybe you can say this is long. We will discuss it later. Um, I think it's, uh, it's not so long because I don't know. <laughs> so um, you can get the same lower bound I think I can get the same lower bound, but it's just way easier to get the same lower bound if there's some Gaussian noise. You can get the same bound. Mm. But you can also get this lower bound if you have noise, if you have no noise, 
which I think might be surprising because uh, in many problems, if there's just a little bit of noise, you can't do as well anymore. Yeah. So in the, in the paper, we have an example. So there's recent work by, I think, Rob Novak, um, where you can show that if you have smooth functions, Sobolev regular functions, and you have noiseless samples, you can actually estimate them with the optimal rate, which is something depending on the smoothness coefficient. Um, as soon as you add like a little bit of noise, that breaks down. So we don't know if the lower bound uh, that people had established before for some estimation problems was due to the noise or not. So that's why we put here a uh, lower bound without noise. And it turns out it is the same as what you would get if you add noise. Of that, I'm not 100% sure. I would have to check the proof again. Maybe there's a slight difference, but I don't think so. OK. Um, Thanks. So this thing here is, is the, the result by Baron. So you can approximate without a curse of dimension. Yeah, and that's quite nice. So this holds for most activation functions, especially it holds for the real loop that we're using here. Um, all right. So now we were able to show the following result um, at the beginning of last year, or sometime last year. Um, maybe it was the beginning of this year. Maybe this should be 2021. It's not important. So if you have a function f and it's a characteristic function of b, um, and it has variant class boundary. So the boundary is now in, it is given locally as a horizon function, and that horizon function is given by a variant function. Then for every n, there exists a neural network uh, phi. It has only four layers, so it's not actually that deep. Um, and for each measure, okay, we'll have to talk about the measure a little bit more. We can estimate the, in this case, a zero one loss between the prediction phi and the true one by this expression here. Okay, there's a constant that depends on the measure. There is a K that depends somehow on how many local patches you need to cover that B. Uh, there's the dimension appearing, but only at, like as a multiplicative constant. And then there's N, that's the number of neurons, to the minus alpha divided by two. Now, if mu would be a uniform measure, then alpha can be chosen equal to one. Otherwise, you can have if the measure is bad, let's say it's very concentrated around the, um, the jump curve, the, so the decision boundary, then the problem just gets harder. And then you get smaller alphas here. But in like a uniform case, you get n to the minus one half. OK, so we can approximate these functions with neural nets quite well. Also, one technical thing that we found is that we can choose the neural net to be always between 0 and 1. OK, so that works quite well. We can approximate this. Now, should I do the proof? Um, yeah, maybe I, I just do that real quick. Um, I hope I, I won't run it over time. So proof is similar to the one before. That's why I just repeat it. It's a localization step first, which this time I will explain how it works. Then we, are, we end up in the horizon, horizon function case. You've seen the argument before, yeah? It's a function like this, which I can write as heavy side composed with something where this is gamma is now a Baron function, we can use the result by Baron to approximate these things um, with just n neurons and shallow net. I can get an approximate information rate of one over square root of n. So I end up with some approximation that is off by one over square root of n. Um, and then basically I need to just plug all of these together and just figure out that, that it works out. So how do I do this localization step? That's maybe interesting. Um, so with neural nets, I can do the following quite nice thing. Um, I can first build some kind of a table top or like a box function, but an approximate one by, well, I have a relu that goes up. Then I have a second one that stops it. Then I have a third one that goes down. Then I have a last one that stops that again. So now I have some kind of um, trapezoid. Um, by rescaling, I can get this as close as I want to something that is a box. Now, how do I get um, a characteristic function of a cube? Well, I can sum up d of those, d of those box functions in each coordinate of the x i1. I subtract d and I add 1. So if all of them are 1, the output is 1. If one of them is not 1, then the output is less or equal than 0. And so if I apply ReLU, it's going to be 0. So this is approximately a high-dimensional box. 
which is kind of nice because I was now able to go from 1D to multiple dimensions and I didn't have to pay a lot, just linearly in D. And now I also want to multiply obviously this box function with the function that I have here to just localize. Now multiplication traditionally is quite hard with neural networks. I mean, hard in the sense of we need a lot of layers. But well, turns out this is not the case if we do binary multiplication. So in fact, instead of multiplying y some function with this box function, I can just apply the ReLU to the characteristic function of that, let's say box of x, add y and subtract y. So just with one layer, I can do a binary multiplication. Um, and that's how we do this localization step here. So that's quite fun. Okay, so that's the proof of this. Now, we want to have a lower bound for the estimation problem with the Baron test. I told you for this, we need to know the L1 entropy of a certain function class. Well, for Baron, the L1 entropy, we first have to find out because in the literature, it's only for P between one and infinity, I think, where one and infinity, I think, are not included. So we establish these two cases. Uh, the covering and packing entropies of the Baron class satisfy these estimates. Um, so yeah, this is the, basically it scales with epsilon to the minus 2d divided by 2 plus d. Um, if we plug these things into our learning bound, then we get as a lower bound this kind of m to the minus and then some more or less complicated exponent. But what I want you to take away from this is that if this is almost m to the minus 1 over 3 m to the minus one over three seems to be the optimal lower bound to learn functions that have a Baron class boundary. If D is very large, then this approach is one over three. That's the best thing you can do. Now, the next question is, can we do it? Yeah, so this is, it's nice because this is a learning bound for a high dimensional, arbitrarily high dimensional discontinuous function just from samples. We can learn it and the rate to learn it does not depend on D. It's kind of, I think to me, it's kind of surprising that this is even possible, but it is possible. Yeah. So we have a lower bound on this learning um, with our result in soup. So there exists an algorithm. Now the question is, does there exist an algorithm that we can also implement empirical risk minimization? Well, you would be surprised. Um, it does. Um, and we use a very, very nice result that we found. <coughs> I call Kim on a Kim. So here I just report a simplified version of it. Um, but it's, it's a very, very general statement um, to get lower bound, uh, upper bounds with empirical risk minimization using the hinge loss. So it's, yeah, it, it was very, very helpful when we found this. Um, so basically, you have any kind of function h. Uh, now you have a function class fn, or you have a series of function classes. They should be bounded in some sense in L infinity. Uh, so it should be in the one ball. And I want them to be such that, I mean, the, it is possible that the hinge loss with the true one and the and FMs, which are in these FM, uh, it is possible that this decays. It decays over rate AM. Yeah, so they exist some FMs, so that this decays. I also know something about the entropy of these FMs. This is again the bracketing entropy. But the good thing is the bracketing entropy if you have the regular entropy in L infinity, you can also get the bracketing entropy. So I need to know something about these entropies here. Um, and this is kind of controlled by this parameter delta m. And that's why these two parameters, am, how well can I approximate the true one, what I want, and delta m, how fast do, or how do my, um, uh, the entropies of these fm grow, where delta m goes to zero and am also goes to zero. Now, epsilon m, that's the accuracy with which I will then learn, is just a max of a m and delta m. There is some technical condition that I want, don't want to talk about. And under these conditions, you can already show that the expected value <coughs> with respect to the sampling, so x i's and y i's, um, uh, will have a risk. So this is the risk with respect to the hinge loss, um, and it will decay as this epsilon m. Yeah? So it's quite a general statement. It's also maybe a bit complicated to wrap your mind around this, but you just basically need that you can approximate, can get the error in the hinge loss to zero, 
and you don't do it with classes that are not too complex, then already everything is done. So we just apply this to our approximation result with the Baron class uh, regular boundary functions. Take the uniform measure. Um, we can specify the size of the networks that you need to classify. So if you have a certain number of samples, we can tell you how many neurons you need. We can tell you how many weights you want. And we can also tell you B, which is the maximum size of your weights. All of this can be specified. And if you, if you optimize over a set of networks with this, these parameters, then, and also four layers, let me put this here, then, well, you get this optimal learning rate, yeah? In the expected value over the samples, and then this is the risk with respect to the hinge loss, um, you find a neural network that gets you this rate, m to the minus one third, plus a small kappa, which, well, we couldn't get rid of. Um, so, but this is the optimal rate, yeah? I told you uh, one third is, for high dimensions, the optimal rate. So up to this kappa, we are there by just empirical risk minimization. And this is without curse of damage, which is also, I think, pretty fantastic. So I want to conclude. And then I want to keep talking afterwards for a little bit because I still have a couple of slides. But uh, I put the conclusion first. Um, so first of all, we can approximate non-trivial high dimensional functions by deep neural networks without a cursive dimensionality. I think this is to me quite interesting because these functions are not continuous. Yeah? I mean, I'm looking at discontinuous high dimension, arbitrarily high dimensional functions and the approximation rate is not really depending on the smoothness. Uh, it's not really depending on dimension, which, yeah, if you had told me this before, then I would not have believed that this is possible, I think. But OK, once you see the proof, obviously, then, then it's suddenly easy. Um, we can even learn those functions with empirical risk minimization. Granted, we use the hinge loss, but we can also use other losses. Um, and we also get rate without cursive dimension. And finally, we can get this close to the optimal rate that any kind of learning algorithm gets. So empirical risk minimization is already quite good. It's not exactly the optimal, um, but it is uh, very, very close to it. So for large dimensions, it's, it's really there. Um, okay. I want to talk very briefly about the references, but I also want to give people the chance to ask questions. So, this first one is uh, the result where we have the approximation rate of the Baron class, but we didn't yet have such a good estimation like the one that we get now. The second one is where we do approximation of piecewise smooth functions, just a little bit older result. The third one is the one that was supposed to be out. I already quite uh, optimistically put it to 2021 here. I hope it's going to be out tomorrow, um, but maybe it's also going to be out on Sunday. And then we have these, this amazing result by Kim Ohne Kim. Um, and there's a similar, very nice study by Imaitsumi Kokumitsu. I didn't mention this, um, but they had uh, the estimation result of the non-smooth functions uh, that we find here in the more general case uh, as well. And the, the first one is this Tsibakov and Maman result that I said at the beginning, where kind of the, the framework of learning was, <clears throat> was laid out. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is we have this special issue um, or topical collection in a journal that is maybe close to this community, something theoretical like process data analysis, Felix and I and Sohail um, are collecting papers on anything to do with harmonic analysis and neural networks and machine learning. So I'll probably also send emails to most of the people here soon, hopefully. All right, thank you very much. I think I should stop because otherwise we don't have time for questions. <laughs>